Becoming a software engineer in this decade seems like such an impossible task now. Apprenticeships and junior software positions seem to have vanished, and the ones that do exist have so much competition that it's almost not even worth applying. I started my first job search in mid-2022, which happens to be around the time that the market got rough. I struggled so much to get in, and I became so obsessive about getting that first job that my mental health took a nosedive, and it actually made me a worse candidate. I experienced failure on a whole new level. But even with all that failure, it's still possible to land a job. Today, I'm going to talk about my journey into the tech world and share some of the lessons I learned while getting there. My trajectory was rather unique, and some of my tips might be hard to hear, but hopefully you'll find my story and my hard-won lessons helpful, and hopefully it'll give you some ideas on how you can rethink your job search if you need to do that. My path into engineering started when I was a teacher. I taught music at a public school for autistic kids, grades K to 5, or ages 4 to 11 if you're not from the States. I was tasked with not only establishing the music curriculum as the school's first music teacher, but also designing that curriculum to improve the school's reading, writing, and math grades. Technology ended up being the most effective tool in my arsenal because it opened up doors for improving lesson accessibility by making my lessons multi-sensory and by making my lessons easy to differentiate all while staying within my school's shoestring budget. But I felt that the technology available to me was inadequate for my students, so I got the crazy idea to invent a unique app for them. And that's when my rabbit hole started. In 2019, I decided to take up coding. I started by learning the basics of Python and JavaScript. I had no idea how I was going to apply it, but my inner voice was telling me to build my programming muscle. So for two years, I was doing simple problems on and off on platforms like Edibit, CodingBat, Mimo, and some other platforms. Then after realizing that knowing basic Python and JavaScript syntax wasn't enough, I enrolled in a part-time bootcamp to jumpstart my software development skills. So whatever time wasn't spent on teaching, lesson planning, grading, all that annoying teacher stuff was spent on my bootcamp, where I learned how to use React, Redux, Flask, Node.js, Express, and PostgreSQL. Once I learned enough to build an app, I started building my own to use in my music classes, hence the app that I wanted to build earlier. I started by making prototypes for different learning tools in vanilla JavaScript, and those prototypes eventually turned into ArtBuddy, which is a collection of 10 games and tools that were aligned with the most common skill gaps that I noticed in my students, built in React and Redux. So that's how I got my start. And I realized while I was building ArtBuddy that this was what I really wanted to do. So I began the search for my next software gig. Now I'm going to share some tips that are based on real failures that I experienced on that job search. And I'm going to sort them by how much I regret not heeding these tips earlier. So my last tip is the tip that I most regret not heeding in the first place. The first tip is don't rely on cold applying. I'm sure you've noticed by now that you're far more likely to receive an auto rejection or to get ghosted entirely. It's tempting to cold apply because that's the easiest way to feel like you're making progress. But unfortunately, technology has made this the weakest approach you can take, and there's a historical reason for this. Back in the pre-internet days, job hunting involved looking through the classified ad section of your local newspaper, sending your resume and cover letter to potential employers by snail mail, and waiting for a response. Back in those days, this actually worked because the applicant pools were smaller. And because this worked, people believed for the longest that this was the standard approach to take when you're job hunting. Today, applying to a job is easier than ever. Anyone from around the world can go to a company's careers page and send off an application within a minute or two. However, this created a new problem. There are hundreds and sometimes thousands of applicants for a single job. And most of them are casual applications, meaning they put no effort in and they're probably not even qualified to do the job. If you're a recruiter or a time-strapped hiring manager, then you're not going to have time to go through all these applications to see who's serious about the position. So you have to find ways to whittle down the applicant pool. There's no time-tested, reliable way to do that other than arbitrary standards that are decided on internally. No one has figured out a scalable or fair solution to 
to this problem. Cold applying can work sometimes, and I have gotten a handful of interviews that way, but relying on cold applying to get a job is like relying on the lottery to get rich. Odds are infinitesimally low, and your effort is better spent on less passive tactics. This actually segues perfectly into my next points. My second tip is, instead of showing value, eliminate risk. You might hear people talk about showing your value as a former public servant. This just sounded like corporate speak to me. And I thought I was already doing this by taking initiative and creating an entire working app from scratch. That's not enough. From a job hunting perspective, try to eliminate risk because there are so many applicants per open job, recruiters and hiring managers will first look for reasons to reject you immediately. These reasons can be as small and arbitrary as having two and a half years of experience instead of three. No evidence of using class components in React, even though class components are old fashioned, let's be honest, or even the way you format your resume. Because as I said earlier, there is no way to whittle down the applicant pool other than arbitrary standards that aren't communicated in the job posting. And while you can't control how recruiters whittle down your applicant pools, there are still things you can do to eliminate risk. First thing you can try is starting a YouTube channel. This was actually one of the reasons I started mine. If someone is considering me for a job, they can come here and they can get a sense of who I am as a person, how my mind works, and the kinds of problems that I enjoy working on. Another thing you can do is post regularly on LinkedIn. Out of LinkedIn's 900 million users, only 3 million post on a weekly basis. That is a fraction of a percent of all the users on the platform. If you can get past your anxiety about posting and get into a rhythm, you're already standing out from the crowd. And don't focus on getting engagement at first. Focus on creating content that clearly communicates your ability. The other option is to proactively make up your own opportunities. Because one of the best ways to reduce risk if you have no experience is to get experience. And this can be as simple as reaching out to small business owners and seeing if they need a website done or redone. I've done this before and it made future employers take me more seriously. William Ray has a great method on his YouTube channel on how to gain clients. So I highly recommend checking out his video once you're done with mine, obviously. The third tip, network like there's no tomorrow. Nearly every opportunity I've gotten in software so far has been through my networking activity on LinkedIn. Yet, it was something that I slept on quite a lot in the beginning. In November 2023, I worked with a career coach named Sean Jane to help me develop a networking strategy where I reached out to as many people as possible in fields that I was interested in. And I reached out to a lot of people, perhaps 20 a day. And this directly led me to my current job after a month. If reaching out to people sounds scary, just know I get it. I'm naturally introverted. And on top of that, I experience social anxiety. Remember that the worst case scenario is that you never hear back. But this is why you reach out to as many people as you can. Response rates on cold outreach are quite low. So don't expect a response from even a small fraction of folks. I'd say a good success rate is one out of 20, which it's better than cold applying. All you really need is one person willing to advocate for you and take a chance on you to turn your life around. When you reach out to a lot of people, you increase your chances that you'll meet that person. My fourth tip, experience and learning are more important than salary at least in the beginning stages of your career. I've gotten to the interview stage at some companies and have actually removed myself from consideration because the salary they were offering was low. Sometimes it was lower than my teaching salary. Looking back, I should have taken them more seriously because they offered learning opportunities that I probably wouldn't have gotten anywhere else and probably wouldn't have been able to come up with on my own. Despite what all the boot camps would have you believe, you're probably not gonna get a remote six-figure job right after graduation. You might get paid in the ballpark of 60 to 90K, maybe a bit more if the company is well-funded or if you're located in a tech hub like San Francisco or New York City. You'll eventually work up to the six-figure salary, but it will take time to get there. In addition, you can always leave for a higher paying job later and you'll be more likely to get it because not only you'll have real work experience, but also companies are more likely to consider you if you're already employed elsewhere because that eliminates risk. 
And now for my last tip and the tip that I wish I had taken more seriously, cut toxic people out of your life. This tip might not seem related to technology or your career transition, but it's more important than you realize because these kinds of people can derail you if you're not careful. These people might think you're absolutely insane for choosing to go into tech and more than likely they have nothing else going on in their life and they might do everything they can to distract you from your goals because they find your potential success threatening. I don't want to go into detail about my personal experience with this one but take it from me, toxic behavior will make your transition into tech more difficult than it needs to be. Whether or not you choose to keep toxic folks in your life is a highly personal decision but their negative influence is not going to stop when you get the job. Building software requires an intense focus and obsession similar to mastering an instrument or practicing a sport. In order to keep up, your mental health needs to be in top shape, and nothing will destroy it faster than a toxic behavior. It's important to surround yourself with people who support you and your ambitions and cut out anyone who tries to take that from you. If there's a toxic person in your life that you can't avoid, use the Grey Rock method on them, which means that your responses to every Everything they say must be as uninteresting as possible. And the goal with that approach is just to make them gradually lose interest in you. So that does it for the tips. Hopefully this hasn't scared you away from programming and hopefully my last tip wasn't too out of the ordinary for you. If anything, the lesson here is that you can get that job if you're reasonable in your expectations, work your butt off for it, and make necessary sacrifices. We're in a bad market right now and experienced people are taking jobs that pay less than they're worth. But if you're really passionate about software and building cool stuff, there's definitely a place for you. You just have to go out and find it. If you found this helpful, insightful, inspirational, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel so that YouTube will show this video to others who might find it helpful. If you're new to this channel, I post videos about different aspects of software engineering, particularly front-end, AI, creative coding, and best practices. So hopefully I'll see you in one of those videos. Until next time.